Welcome to Fresh Air, a reading by VoiceWorks Online. I'd like to acknowledge that this event is broadcast from the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. I'm recording this on the stolen lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We also pay our respects to the traditional custodians of all lands from which our readers are presenting in this broadcast. We acknowledge the lands on which this broadcast reaches and acknowledge First Nations people as the traditional custodians of this country, whose cultures are among the oldest living cultures in human history. We pay respect to the elders of these communities, past and present, and extend that to emerging community leaders. We recognize that sovereignty was never ceded and that colonization is an ongoing process. It was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. My name's Rory Green. I'm one of the online editors for VoiceWorks. For those of you who don't know, VoiceWorks is a national literary journal that features exciting new writing and art by young Australians. Our purpose is to create a space for people under 25 to develop their creative and editorial skills and to publish and be paid for their fiction, non-fiction, poetry, art and comics. Each selected piece goes through a collaborative editing process and we provide individualized feedback for all unsuccessful submissions. Our online publishing arm, VoiceWorks Online, launched in 2018 and aims to publish digitally specific literary work. In partnership with the Emerging Writers Festival, VoiceWorks Online is bringing you a week of fresh air. Each day, a new breath. Each day, a new artist presents a new digital work. In this reading, the artist will be guiding you through their pieces. This event also marks VoiceWorks Online's shift to periodic publishing. First up, we have Zoe Douglas Kinghorn reading Shifting Baseline Syndrome. Zoe Douglas Kinghorn is a young writer, activist and dairy hand living on Eastern Ma and Gunditch Mara lands. Her essays and poetry have been published in Island Magazine, The Lifted Brow, VoiceWorks, Cordite, Meandrin Online and more. In 2018, she won the Scribe and Express Media Nonfiction Prize. Thanks, Zoe. A note on the text. A trophic pyramid is a basic representation of how energy moves through biological communities, how it accumulates, transforms, dissipates. The base of energy is made up of producers and the top is generally made of consumers. When energy is transferred up the trophic pyramid, most of it is lost as heat energy, life. The base of the pyramid is populated by organisms called autotrophs, the primary producers of the ecosystem. Think trees, mosses, algal blooms. They spin water and sunlight into energy. They breathe out oxygen and vivify the sky. All other organisms in the ecosystem are classified as consumers called heterotrophs, which either directly or indirectly depend on the primary producers for food energy. Kind of like an omnivore, but autos rely on hets for nutrient fixing and other errands. It's not so much a hierarchy as it is a shifting network of interdependence and exchange. Predators are usually at the top of the pyramid. They get energy from eating the bottom layers. As a general rule, an energy system can only function sustainably if it has the support of a larger base of producers and a relatively small amount of predators at its apex. Continue. Do you say, or hello? You bleat out a long, after a while the ing throbs in your ears. You have no headphones, so you try to synthesize the music. Imagine a sound. Listen, it's the purr of a flute from the lips of a dryad whipping through the canopy amongst the trees draped in green. Go forward 200 years. A flock of sheep now roams the moors where there once were tangled wildernesses, hills now shorn to grass, marshes dredged and tamed. The bottom fell out of the trophic pyramid of energy producers. The sheep are asking you a question.
You are an android, dreaming of electric sheep. You count all the ghosts of sheep flying in the sky. You count over a million and fall asleep. Or you go for a drive. You remember going for a drive through the country, stopping at the petrol station to find swarms of insects splayed across the windscreen, barbecued in the grill of the car. When you get to the servo, you hop out. The fumes infiltrate your brain cells. You grab the window wiper from the bucket of suds. Where are the moths? Nobody knows. As a species, we immediately forget what is lost and only see what exists right here, right now, as the new normal. Every generation is experiencing huge shifts in what passes for a natural system. These changes have become more extreme over the last few generations. What we see as dead landscapes, our kids will see as natural and normal. There is a phrase for this, and most of us these days suffer from it. It's called shifting baseline syndrome. Mary Reynolds, former landscape designer. You think maybe there is a creature who is old enough to remember. In Alaska's North Slope, there are bowhead whales that are older than Moby Dick. Some are said to be over 200 years old. Go back 200 years in the past. Drum has died down, vibration steadied, the rhythm muted. The silence takes generations to set in. Generational amnesia is when knowledge is not passed down from generation to generation. For example, people may think of as pristine wilderness, the wild places that they experienced during their childhood. But with every generation, this baseline becomes more and more degraded. Dr. E.J. Milner Gulan. Wilderness. The notion of wilderness as a purely unchanged space can in itself be a forgetting, a silencing. By classifying tracts of nature as pristine, we erase the storied networks of relationships between people and land. Ecologist David Bowman speculates on the role of indigenous people 25,000 to 12,000 years ago in supporting endangered species with land management. Were it not for the presence of Aboriginal people at the height of the last ice age, the combined effect of fire and aridity may have been the coup de grace for many species that had barely survived previous glacial cycles. Something is changing. Now we see country being devastated by intercidal firestorms, the result of colonial greed and endemic mismanagement. I think of what my man was saying now. When I was a kid in the 80s, her and mum would have long conversations about the state of the world while I sat in a city brown beanbag, listening in bars. Nan said the end of the world is coming because of the damage that colonized people are doing to our land. They don't listen. Paula Bella, a Wemba Wemba interested from our visual artist, curator, writer, and lecturer. Do you remember the fires of 2020? Beneath the roar of the fires, over a thousand million animals died. More than 130 species were threatened with extinction as their homes burned. One of them is the southern corroboree frog. We all know frogs go la di da di da, croak, and galump. and enjoy the rest of EWF 2020. Thanks Zoe. Next up we have Evie Hillier. Evie Hillier, otherwise known as Yves, is a Sydney-based comic artist who specialises in drawing her feelings and eating her feelings. Evie will be reading IS0L8710N. 
Hello, my name is Evie Hillier, or Yves, and I've done a little interactive comic um, based on my experience of isolation, and it's called Isolation. <laughs> um, thanks to Rory Green from VoiceWorks to, for helping me get this to where it's at now. Um, with me to outline how it works is my beautiful friend, partner, and lover, <laughs> Xavier Vesky Noonan. Lover. <laughs> That's a little fun. Yeah. Hello. Hi. How are you going? Oh, yeah. Not bad. That's great. Okay. So we're going to start off um, with the title screen, which is actually your departure card. So in order to, for me to send you into space, which is what we're doing, I'm just going to have to get some information off you. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Checks and balances. <laughs> that sort of thing. Exactly. Um, what's your favorite fruit? It's the most important thing for departure. Uh, I like raspberries. Let's go with that. Raspberries. Okay. Because it's a good fruit and it's also a good sound. Let's put that in. Um, a name of a pet. Now, this can be one that you've owned in the past or one that you've got in your head or... Um, I really want to get a beagle and name it Bagel. It's very cute. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Okay, Bagel. Sure. Um, your favorite place in the world? Mm, Where's uh, your happy place? Where do you wish you could be all the time? I mean, it's, we're there right now. We're recording for bed. I think we've got to say bed, right? Bed? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right? I love bed too. Um, something nice that happened to you in the last week? Uh, it's been a funny week. Um... I had a nice Zoom call with my grandma. Does that work? Yeah. Nice Zoom call with grandma. Beautiful. And the name of someone you love. Hmm. I feel like I'm being put in a tricky position here. Oh, I don't I? know what you're talking I about. Don't know. I feel a little compelled to pick someone. Uh, oh, yeah? Within my nearby radius. Uh huh. Um, Just give me a name, Zave. Okay. Um, Evie. Oh, that's very sweet. Yeah. Thank you. I tried to resist and I could not. All right. We're departing. Approaching. Approaching. Commencing landing. Landing. Arrived. Oh, did you want to do the sound effects? Oh, can I? Yeah. I was going to say, is that is that it? Is it because that that was fun, but it was uh, <laughs> brief. <laughs> no, it keeps going. <laughs> so this is Planet Evie. Yeah. <laughs> huh. You are a horticulturalist sent to Planet Evie to grow raspberries. <laughs> You're alone. Oh. The alien life is friendly, if not annoying. I actually might get you to do the voice of the little guys. Sure. The alien life is friendly, if not annoying. Really? Should I, is that a good voice? Perfect. I love it. <laughs> the native species does not have a cry of its own. Rather, it mimics... The native species doesn't have a cry of its own, but rather it mimics... <laughs> really good. You get the gist. The next spaceship is coming. You must be ready. It works for me being alone. There are no distractions for getting things done. There are no distractions for getting <laughs> things done. <laughs> well, almost none. Well, almost none. <laughs> That's really good. Am I? I feel like I'm underselling the, uh, <laughs> the mood. <laughs> I know it's bizarre, but the air on Evie smells exactly like it did at bed. <laughs> it makes a bit of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you were stinking up the bed. All right. <laughs> bed. That's my favorite place on Earth. Uh. That's where I'm from. Soon there'll be other people from there, too. Other people. Friends. I just have to be ready.
The raspberries here are not like the ones on Earth. The gravity has made them flat. They taste the same, though. Taste. Taste. Try this bagel. <laughs> I named the foreign species bagel. <laughs> I'm fully aware that they'll be renamed something scientific, probably in Latin. But I take great joy in knowing that on their future Wikipedia page, they will be first called bagel. Great joy. <laughs> Do you know what bagel is in Latin? I don't. Mm. Bagelus Maximus. Really good. Mm -hmm. So nothing else to do but wait for the next spaceship. It's the little things I miss about Earth. Like when I had a nice Zoom call with Grandma. If I had known then that this would be my life now, I would change everything. I would never stay home. I would never sleep. I would drink life as if I were dying of thirst, rather than just let it feed me like a watering can to a houseplant. Every day I wake up and I do the same things. How many days has it been? How many more? There are no distractions for getting things done. There are no excuses for not getting things done. When? I feel like I've achieved all there is to achieve. There's no room for more goals. It's just maintaining what I have. It's not enough. I don't remember how to feel anything else. Remember. Remember what? Distractions for getting things done. What do you mean? Other people. Friends. <laughs> Bed. Raspberries. Mm. I had a nice Zoom call with Grandma. Bagel. Evie. The next spaceship is coming. Yes. And that's it. Thanks for hanging out, guys. That was so nice. <laughs> Thanks, Evie. Next up, we have Lauren Ironmonger. Lauren Ironmonger is a writer and researcher. She is currently working as a research assistant at the University of New South Wales, investigating collaboration and resistance by Indigenous people under French colonial rule. Her work has appeared in VoiceWorks and Rough Cut. Lauren will be reading Of Womb and Water. Once or twice in a neon, there are these moments where two polar visions collide. A stray talon punctures the star sheet, tearing flesh wound of light and chaos. He is one of them. We're in post-war Germany. While women in the West twist and jive in their Levi's to Elvis, the Stones, the Beatles, their counterparts to the East by their Levi's on the black market, socialising in subterranean hubs of hush the free spirit of democracy shouldering the cold blanket of socialism to the east. But within the privacy of the bedroom, something strange happens. No longer structured by property, social relations in communist Germany converge around a nucleus of love. Women, supposedly no longer economically betrothed to men under the fist of capitalism, begin to report on freer, more pleasurable sex lives. Socialist society, by its very design, seem to have accidentally facilitated women's optimum pleasure. Here's another. We're hurtling towards the greatest mass extinction event in human history. I want so badly to be a home for you, to feel your tiny fingers furl around one of mine, as all babies instinctively do. But I know you'll never be. My insides, so I've been told, are inhospitable to life. A tour of my intestines reveal many marvellous attractions congealed glob of microplastics, lake of toxins, nebula of radiation. And what's this? Sky sent Franken babe of meat and steel? Are you omen or offering? And so this is where the trouble starts. Stepping out of your car, you take a deep breath, expecting to smell the tangle of fish guts, eucalypt, saltine air, petrol, that you so strongly associate with these parts. Breathe in. Nothing. You smell nothing at all. Hey, V's leaning on the bonnet of her car. Over here. 
She squeezed herself into her old fishing vest and trousers. She looks ridiculous, you think. The hem of her pants barely clears her knees now. She juts her hip to the side and cocks up her chin. Wouldn't mum be proud? She made this for me, remember? You're a little too old to be wearing that, don't you think? You tease. Come on, let's get going. I want to be done before it gets dark. The river is totally different to what it had been when you'd grown up here. The basin has been replenished under the government's water resource plan. Where the grass licking the riv river's shores had once been dry and yellow, pretty topiarized hedges now grow. There's a gravel trail and bicycle path hemming its entire length. Families like to come here on weekends for a mini break. Escaping the repressive Sydney pollution, they come to breathe clean filtered air and cycle through a bushland that just, that's an imitation of a distant past. Onwards. What do we have here? Stop and take a look. You and V park and walk to the shed. The two of you carry out the old rowboat and set out along the river. Beneath the peeling green paint, you can still make out the initials U and V carved into the wood as teenagers. V and S forever. You row. V kind of just sits back and orders you around. More to the left. Faster, faster. You're not going fast enough here. Okay, stop. Here's good. Stop. You stop and set up anchor. The water is so clear you can see straight through to the river floor, carpeted with perfectly round stones and neat rows of seagrass peeking through the rocks. Murray Darling Cod, brown trout, spangled perch, nudge up against the bow of the boat. Piecing shrimp flesh with rusted metal hooks, you lower the line into the water. Something bites. Gotcha. In 2020, the last of the Murray Darling Cod population died out. As part of the Goodwin government's regeneration plan, their extinction had been reversed. These were bona fide river cod, slick imitations of the real thing. Grown in laboratories, they'd putted to life in glass-walled tubes, sprouting fins and sporting the same spotted coats of their predecessors. From the lab, they were driven en masse to the riverside and dumped into the clear water, itself a phony reproduction of the real thing. It's not really the same, is it? V starts. Hmm? You're not really listening as you focus on reeling in a particularly heavy trout. To be honest, I don't like coming here anymore. It's creepy. She drags her fingertips through the water and continues. I mean, this water, it's so clear. And the fish, she picks up one of your catches and angles it towards her, so she's looking it dead in the eyes so as to, to address it directly. You barely put up a fight. Swam right into our arms as if you had been expecting us all along. Nodding, you reach down and plunge a fist into the water. Water has memory. This you know to be true. This is what mum used to tell you. You're both back at mum's tonight. You like to come up and keep the house company. Warm its chairs, eat off its plates, open and close its doors. While you cook dinner, V slides her bum up onto the counter and starts munching on the green beans that she's supposed to be stringing for you. Next to the fridge, the fish are bucking their tails and flapping their heads in the pail of water you've left them in. Plunging your hand into the slimy school, you pick one out at random and place it on the kitchen bench top. A quick sharp blow to its head, right between the eyes, and it's out. You take out your paring knife and slash its stomach clean open. Drain the blood, skim off the scales, scoop out the roe, pull out the guts, heart, kidney, stomach, liver, rinse off with cold, fresh water. This time though, something's different. As you go to take out the kidney, your hand brushes up against something hard, unnatural. What is that? You put down the knife and use your fingers to open up the crevice further, unceremonious, unceremoniously exposing the cod's insides and the alien object it had failed to digest. Some of its scales flake off and get stuck under your nails. The flesh makes an uncomfortable squelching sound as you dig around its insides a little. You know it's already long gone, but still want to be a little gentle. Respect for the dead and whatnot. Rest in peace. Always say grace before digging in. From now until the end of time, may we abide in you. Amen. V peers over your shoulder to observe the autopsy in action. Bloody hell, she starts giggling. Realising what it is, 
You squeal, and then you fight back a smirk. That is a beast of a thing. How do you even get his mouth around that, let alone into his stomach? Honestly, I'm impressed, V continues. Bravo to the little guy in his unhinged jaw. You and V are silent once more as you peer down at the disemboweled specimen. Two shades of pink stare back at you. Malibu Barbie's magenta dildo cradled by blushing folds of fish flesh. The visual in innuendo was hardly subtle. This is heinous, you think to yourself. It's a total aberration, a glitch in the simulation to which you bear witness. Glancing up at Mum's hanging portrait of the Virgin Mary, you have half a mind to turn it around. If Grandma was here, you think she'd prescribe three Hail Marys, but she's not. So instead, you push the mutant to the side and do as you've always done. You get on with it. You pull another fish out of the bucket. V, on brand as usual, has recovered Barbie's plaything and set it atop the counter. High priestess, priestess of devilish delight, I pray thee, take me. She kneels and surrenders herself before it. Blood, scales, roe, guts, water. Thankfully, Fish 2.0 didn't seem to have had the same exotic taste for bright pink latex. After dinner, V goes to bed early while you decide to stay up for a bit. You're in the living room watching TV on your relic of a plasma TV. It's late and there's not much on except for a rerun of SpongeBob SquarePants, an old childhood favourite. It's the episode where the inhabitants of Bikini Bottom performed David Glenn Isley's anthemic classic, Sweet Victory, at the aquatic version of the Super Bowl. You and V would always belt along, squeezing your eyes shut as you gave the lyrics everything you had. And it's ours for the taking, it's ours for the fight. The episode finishes and you decide to turn in. Walking past V's room on your way to the kitchen, you can hear that she's watching David Attenborough's Planet Blue. You pause for a moment outside her door and hear a faint buzz, a slight whimper, a giggle. A single tentacle could kill a fish, zzz, or in rare cases, a human. V's altar is still sitting on the kitchen bench. You poke a finger into its swollen womb and then hover a hand over your own, sensing the phantom presence of a child who will never be. Your genealogy? Lost. This you know. But motherhood, this is not lost. How can motherhood act as a model for care? Not motherhood as the ability to bear a child, but motherhood as a kind of radical kinship. Motherhood as a big fat fuck you to a government that has failed its people. Motherhood as having one, one another's back as community. Motherhood as shelter from the storm. Motherhood as love. Joanna Hedva says, Perhaps then, and only then, you think, finally, capitalism will screech to its much needed, long overdue and motherfucking glorious halt. Thanks, Lauren. Next, we will be showing Danielle Goda's video piece, Exercise Ball. Danielle is an actor and multidisciplinary artist currently studying fine arts at RMIT. Her undergraduate degree in theatre and her full-time training at 16th Street Actors Studio led her to co-found Dirty Pennies and further integrate theatre making into her artistic practice. Her work incorporates poetry, photography and performance in video, utilising storytelling techniques to illuminate the seemingly mundane and to shine a light on the hidden corners of our experience. Her work plays with the diaristic and explores different vehicles for confession. For the launch, Danielle's recorded a commentary of the video. You can watch Exercise Ball without the commentary on the Voice Folks website. Thanks, Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle Goda. I'm the artist in front of and behind Exercise Ball. This has been an ongoing theme that I keep returning to throughout my artistic practice because I hold it very close to me and it's in my body and it's in my memories. And even seeing an Exercise Ball to this day takes me straight back. It's quite important to me because it actually took me a long time to pinpoint the disconnect that I, to this day, have to my body. Because something so innocent and sacred that I didn't really understand as a child was broken or taken away from me by adults who didn't understand. 
it's been a long process of having to unravel all of this. From a young age, girls are taught to disconnect from their bodies and to have shame for the mere fact that we have a body. And it's not until we're older that we, or at least I, realise that I've been carrying this shame for so long and I didn't want it anymore. I have explored this through different mediums and the more I share the story, the more I hear experiences from other women and it's so unifying. It's this beautiful sharing and exchange of stories that I hope to connect people to and so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks Danielle. Our next piece is Queering Out of Religion by Lauren Shelley. Lauren writes about queerness and religion, and you can find her on Twitter. I'm in Fitzroy on a Sunday morning, and everything is quiet. It's July, but the sky is clear, the air breezy. The last party goers are trampling home, and empty cans lie in the street. My stomach feels twisted. I walk, hoping that the church is on the next side street, and I haven't got the wrong address. I start to wonder if this is a stupid idea, but I turn the corner and, sure enough, I see the cathedral. High Anglican with sturdy bricks and spires. I pass through its wrought iron gate and a garden with a winding path. At the entrance, an usher greets me, slips me a service bulletin, and I find a spot in a pew by myself. No one joins me, but I notice some curious smiling glances directed my way. The light in here is dim and filtered through the high stained glass panels. There's an organ and a grand looking altar. I sit quietly for a while as people, mostly with gray or graying hair, file in, take their seats. I feel the vastness of the space press against me. I feel my resistance. I hear shuffles of feet echoing. The service begins and I find myself rising in muscle memory with the congregation as the priest enters with the cross bearer and the worship hosts. The priest walks with a chalice of incense and we sit down again in familiar rhythm. The haze billows up with the organ chords. In one of my earliest memories, I'm sitting on the carpet of the church community room next to my baby sister. She's in a laced baptism dress, hair slick with anointing oil. There's a photo framed of us like this together, but I remember being in that body inside that photo too. My blood impressions and borders of myself all began there, in amorphousness, in the womb of this building. I emerged from those rhythms of song and silence and yellow-tinged light. When I left Faith, it wasn't because I was queer. I left because, if I'd stayed, I would have suffocated. I grew through and then out of it. I needed the distance to see where I'd come from. I was brought up Lutheran, an old Germanic denomination of Christianity. The religious lineage in my family runs long and deep in all directions. My Lutheran maternal grandfather arrived here from Germany after the Second World War. And my father comes from the Wimmera region in Western Victoria from Grumelok land where we can trace our family back to the Lutheran emigrants who colonised in the 1830s. My parents met on a youth camp and sent me and my siblings to the Lutheran school that my mother went to before us. Every Sunday I saw my teachers in the pews and my closest friends were all from youth group. It's hard to describe to other people what it was like to be so intensely churched, but until I was 18, I didn't know anything else. 
My childhood was spent sitting in the sanctuary hall, listening to murmurs over microphones, the endless turn of thin paper pages. I was crouched on the carpet in Sunday school watching reenactments of Bible stories, going to lunches and picnics with quiches, casseroles and family. I was visiting faraway cousins in their congregations where my uncles were pastors. Religion and faith community were wrapped around me so entirely, pressed tight and warm, safe and insular. In my teenage years, the idea of sexuality was mostly pre-conscious to me. In youth, we only mentioned sex when we talked about marriage. On one youth camp, our pastor brought out a crisp green apple and passed it among us, asking each of us to take a bite as a way of conveying the holiness lost each time you had sex with a new person. That whole period of adolescence is cryptic in hindsight. My feelings toward boys gradually became visceral, stark and obvious. The moments with girls were harder to interpret, easier to bury in the charged awkwardness of puberty, in locker room embarrassments, learning to change crop tops under shirts, discomfort and fascination in bodies as they morphed beyond my control. The idea of having a sexuality in an individual sense seemed lewd to me, inconvenient at the most. I decided not to have one and buried myself in schoolwork. I felt alienated from my feelings. I find them hard to locate, even now. I was 13 and excited to leave the overcrowded Sunday school room and join the youth downstairs in the underground. When it happened. The youth had a hip and cool counterculture, a Christian idea of insurgency and resistance. For three years, we attended a confirmation class called Head to the Heart, H to H for short, and met every Friday night and every Sunday after church to eat dinner together, share our highs, hi, uh, share our highs and lows of the week, read the Bible and sing. In one of these sessions, we were singing and I was sitting cross-legged next to one of the youth leaders. We were singing and my gaze fell on her breasts and then jumped away. And it was enough time for her to notice. She stared back at me hard and I felt hot shame rise up in my throat, along with another incomprehensible feeling. We never spoke about it and I didn't have the words to be able to. I could recite the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Doxology, the entirety of the Bible's books in sequential order but I didn't have the words to describe that moment. On my confirmation day, I stood at the pulpit in front of all the people I grew up with, the families who nurtured me, and all of my peers. My English teacher from school stood proudly in the pews, as did my music teacher, our organist. My grandparents and godparents travelled across the city and state lines to be there. My friends and I wore white robes and stoles, decorated just the week before with the craft supplies and hot glue gun from the youth room, heady smells of hormones and pizza in the air. We were full of anticipation. We had spent three years growing our faith and identity together. And on that day, we would finally graduate this milestone. I read my first public confession. It takes a long time to get through the speeches along with the usual liturgy and music. We confessed the creeds, confirmed our baptism and formally became members of the church. We were met with standing applause, handshakes and hugs. Afterwards, my family hosted a big lunch at our house with barbecued meat, salads, cake and gifts. I felt fully loved and contained. I was given a cross with a verse from Ephesians, a necklace with a pendant shaped like a fish, a pocket devotion from my English teacher. 
I was given a family tree Bible, a pocket Bible, a student Bible, and a box set audio narration of the Bible in its entirety. I felt overwhelmed with love and belonging overflowing. My doubts stuffed furtively away. When I finished high school, I felt adrift and restless. The structures that held up my life were suddenly pared back, the whole world agape. I craved independence, felt the need to prove myself. I worked for a year in a minimum wage job and then left for Canberra to study. My parents helped me find a new church home, a Lutheran congregation in the suburbs. I moved into a college and started going to a student-run Bible studies group. We moved through the Old Testament Book of Kings at a trudging pace. Everything was going to plan, and I was uneasy about it. That's ten minutes. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, that's it. Uh, thanks so much again to all of our amazing writers. Um, you can read their pieces or, or view their pieces on voiceworksmag.com.au. Um, thanks to Emerging Writers Festival for having us and thank